tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. Do you think I'd have the right sheet in front of me? All right. Uh, we'll call to order the planning board meeting April 20th, 2021. As a result of the COVID-19 virus, the planning board will conduct a meeting via remote access as provided by Maine law. The planning board will use Zoom meeting to conduct a meeting and to allow the public to remotely attend and participate. Zoom will allow all planning board members, applicants, and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. So uh, welcome everybody. The first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Does anybody have any changes? Do I, hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Move we, we approve as written the yes. minutes from the second. Meeting. Okay, so Jonathan second. Maureen, we please take the roll. Certainly. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Um, sorry, Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. And Chair Hubner. Yes. Okay, motion passes you know, uh, the minutes are approved unanimously. The next item on the agenda, town center affordable housing amendments. The town council is referred to the planning board uh, amendments to the town center district to enable an affordable housing project, section 19-10-3 public hearing. The February 8th, 2021 meeting, the town council voted seven to nothing to refer to the planning board the following motion. Ordered the Cape Elizabeth town council refers to the planning board development of town center affordable housing amendments. The amendment should preserve town center requirements to the extent feasible while also permitting an affordable housing project that provides a substantial public benefit. Recommended amendments should be returned to the town council by April 30th, 2021. In addition, staff is directed to develop TIF, TIF district and shared parking proposals to be completed by May 1st, 2021 for town council consideration. Um, before we get into the uh, um, the uh, the, me the uh, hearing comments from the public. Um, the planning board is charged with providing advice to the to the town council re regarding the amendments to the zoning zoning ordinance. We're required to hold a public hearing, which is what we're going to do uh, tonight. And uh, the. Request from the town council, town council provided the deadline, but if we're not able to come to an agreement tonight, uh, all, in all likelihood, the town council will provide an extension. So, uh, so there's that. So before again, before we get into that, um, Maureen, would you discuss the difference between uh, zoning amendments and site plan review? Just. Uh, as a refresher to everybody and for the public? Yes, thank you very much, because there has been a lot of public comment received on these amendments, and it, it appears that some of the public comment, uh, not surprisingly, uh, there's a little bit of confusion on, on what those processes are. So what the planning board has been asked to do, and I know the board knows this, but for the public as well, is you've been asked to advise on changing the ordinance. And anyone can ask for an ordinance change. This developer has asked for an ordinance change. And the ordinance change is uh, something that has a very prescribed public process. Uh, for zoning ordinance amendments, the, it has to, the change has to be sent to the planning board. The planning board must be given an opportunity to advise the council. The planning board must hold a public hearing before it grants advice following the planning board's recommendation back to the council. The council typically sends that amendment to the ordinance committee, they review it. All of these meetings are public and advertised. Uh, it goes back to the council and then the council who are the elected representatives of the town uh, hold the public hearing and then make a decision about the change to the ordinance. Once the ordinance is changed, the planning board doesn't have a ton of flexibility. And 
it's different from site plan review and you have received comments that the planning board maybe has been very flexible with this particular large developer but hasn't been very flexible with small town developers and it should be made clear that none of the recent applications to the planning board for small projects in the town center have been requests for zoning amendments they have all been requests for site plan review and site plan review is a specific project review the planning board is required to do that review in accordance with the standards in the ordinance and the board doesn't have the flexibility to waive those standards those standards have been adopted using the ordinance process where the public has had lots of involvement and the elected officials have adopted those rules so it's just important to understand there is a difference between ordinance changes and site plan review the other thing is that site plan review is a very specific review of a project and that's where things like buffering lighting parking traffic, et cetera, et cetera, are really looked at in more detail. Uh, I, I just wanted to provide that review because there does seem to be a lot of um, mushing about between those two things. Okay. I see Jonathan has his hand up. I was going to say any questions, but there are, you're, you're beating me to the point. Go ahead, Jonathan. And, and Maureen, correct me if I'm wrong, but none of the recent developments or any developments for a very long time have been specific to providing something along the lines of uh, affordable housing or something that would be considered a public benefit? Um, I would say the last time in the town center we had something that would fall under what I consider public benefit would be 2014-2015 uh, when the Village Green proposal was uh, submitted and that was preceded by an ordinance amendment that the planning board participated in writing uh, prior to that. The only affordable housing the town has seen developed has been in accordance with the mandatory affordable housing provisions. None of those have been in the town center and those provisions were adopted, I believe in 1992. And none of the smaller projects that you mentioned were uh, public benefits in that way besides the Village Green. Yeah, there's, there's nothing in those that I would have called a substantial public benefit. I would say that definitely those projects had merit to the property owners and might be um, well received by residents, but something that I would call a substantial public benefit would be like the creation of a village green, which is over and above what you see every day. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Carol Ann. Maureen, uh, the council met on this topic last week. Could you uh, give us an overview? Yes, so uh, I just described this ordinance amendment process and you probably all noted that it goes from the council to the planning board, the planning board advises, sends its advice back to the council. And typically while it's in front of the planning board, there isn't really any other action. However, uh, the developer of the affordable housing project has made it clear that they need a minimum of 49 units in order to make the, uh, the financing that makes the affordable housing affordable. And it did not look like they were gonna be able to get all four of the amendments that they were requesting. And we're beginning to wonder whether they should proceed further. And for that reason, did ask for a workshop with the council. The council had that workshop on, I believe it was April 5th. And they talked almost exclusively about the what we consider the fourth amendment that the applicant has asked for. And that's the one where they can replace the first floor non-residential uses with uh, affordable housing apartments. And there was a, what I think would be fair to say, a robust majority of the council that was uh, willing to consider not requiring um, the non-residential uses on the first floor. There was no vote. It was a sense of the council. Okay, all right. Any or, I'm sorry, can you just repeat that? The, the, the council was in favor of it or was not in favor of it? They, were, they are in favor of letting that requirement go. They are okay, okay. with putting affordable housing on the first floor because that will get you to the 49 units that makes the financing possible, that makes the project possible. So they are, they are, it, and like I said, there was no vote 
but it looked like what I would call a robust majority would is is okay with not requiring those commercial uses on the first floor. Is okay. that clear? In case yes, I muddled thank it. you. No, no, okay. no. That was clear. Sorry about that. Thanks. No, I, I think I muddled it. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Um, with that, then I'm, I'm going to open the meeting up for public hearing. Any members of the public who uh, are attending via Zoom and would like to comment, please use the raise hand feature so Maureen can set it up so you can speak. You'll have three minutes to comment. Um, and Maureen will start her timer when you start speaking. Uh, what, that when you first get on and start speaking, please give your name and address clearly enough so that Hiromi can quickly uh, write it down uh, for the record. So she would appreciate that immensely, I think. Um, so anyway, so uh, raise your hand if you want to speak. Marina, I just, I'll let you, let's see. I just recognized Mr. Magnoli. Okay, yeah. Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mario Magnoli. I live at 15 Dearborn Drive. Um, thanks for having me. I just wanted to say uh, that I think that I would, the planning board uh, should you know, go back to the town council and hopefully advise them that um, you know, the proposed project might not be possible uh, to fit within the, the town center plan. Um, and the reason I say this is uh, it, it does appear that I'm looking at the comprehensive plan here, which is fantastic but everyone was asked what kind of housing you support. Um, even looking at the number of people who said they do support uh, development and things like that, 81% um, of the people said they do not support apartments. I mean, that, that's pretty much the only statistic I'm looking at, but it seems very clear that the town does not put this affordable housing project in the realm of, uh, I guess, public benefit. They, they just disagree with, with, with that sort of um, argument. Anyway, I, I can go on about how much I don't want it. And it, it just seems that the town doesn't want it. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop rambling on here, but I'm just hoping that the, the planning board doesn't approve the amendments and then advises the town council um, that it may not be uh, feasible. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Okay, does anybody else wish to speak? Please, please raise your hand. I see Rachel. Rachel, can Rachel, you hear me? Unmute. This is uh, Rachel and Piotr Stamyashkin. Um, I'm at, we're at 27 Stonegate Road and um, I'm speaking on behalf of both of us. Um, we feel that it's very positive development and necessary that Cape Elizabeth address the needs to provide affordable housing in our community. We think that the town center is a great place for it. Um, we believe that this kind of housing is needed and would probably make our town more diverse. Um, we also, um, are concerned about um, the number of units that are uh, larger apartments. We feel that in order to have a, a diverse and vibrant town center, that any development like this development should have one and two bedroom apartments and also three bedroom apartments. Um, we understand that there may be some financial feasibility reasons that this is impossible. However, um, we think that we should aspire to do that. Um, let's see. Um, while the project might be financially challenging for the developers, we think the town should strive to find the best possible solution, recognizing economic realities. Um, and we understand that um, we have this comprehensive plan that, and that this project would require significant uh, zoning, um, uh, zoning amendments um, or 
exceptions. Um, and we wonder about whether this kind, the comprehensive plan as it's written um, would basically make any project such as this um, not feasible. So we're kind of curious um, about that. Um, we express our concerns with the Zantin company and we had a good conversation and we believe that um, many of our, um, our concerns, two of our concerns were addressed. One, if the town were to approve parking, we felt that the parking situation was not, um, not good. Um, but with additional parking behind town hall, uh, that, would, that would be addressed. And um, having two bedroom apartments instead of all one bedroom apartments is better than just all one bedroom apartments, but we also would like to see some three bedroom apartments. Um, we feel like doing nothing is not a good option. And we feel that the Zantin company is an excellent company and has proven to create good developments. Um, am I done? Yeah. That, that's <laughs> I'm wrapping up. So I feel like we should, we should all um, strive to have the best affordable housing for our community, given our objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you for your comments. I see uh, uh, some age well coordinator uh, has their hand up. And it looks like they're on mute. Yeah. Age well, if you can unmute. Yeah, this is Jim Clark. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Good, Jim. Good to talk to you. Thanks for giving me the floor for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> I am not in favor of this development as the, the amendments currently stand, and I understand them. Hey, hey Jim? Yeah. Jim, could you give your, your full name and, and your, your address? Yeah, Jim Clark, 350 Ocean House Road. Um, I'll say it again. I'm not in favor of this, this proposal or the amendments to the proposal as they stand very much supportive of affordable housing. I attended one of the neighborhood meetings that Zantin Company had. I understood that they had changed their plan to a limited degree to allow for some two bedroom units. It doesn't seem to me like <clears throat> there's enough multiple bedroom units as the prior speaker mentioned to really uh, make that substantial benefit in terms of diversified community and all that goes along with it. Uh, and knowing that the, the community at large worked very diligently to come up with the, the guidelines and, and, and the ordinances that are in place for this kind of a project, um, I think more due diligence on the part of the Zantin Company uh, would be necessary before I could get comfortable with these amendments being approved. And I think it's also pretty clear <clears throat> uh, that the night of the neighborhood meeting that I attended and also what was just mentioned tonight, that there may be a financial showstopper for Xanton in the current design. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I believe that huh? it's important okay. uh, for uh, the, the town, the town council to, stick to uh, stick to its guns and to make sure that whatever proposal for the town of Green comes forward is one that really does meet, meet those amendments, well, not the amendments, but the original guidelines that were in place. Thank you very much. Sorry for the confusion. If I had known how to change my uh, identification before I logged into this call, I would have done it. Unfortunately, I have multiple Zoom accounts that I use. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, Jim. Let's see. Does anybody else have their hand up? I'll wait a little bit in case there's any. I see uh, Nate. Nathan Zanton has his hand up. Can you hear me, Nate? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead. If I can turn on my camera. I guess maybe that's not possible. Um, no problem. I just wanted to, so I'm the president of the Zanton Company. Um, we're the developer of the project that's being discussed, that's kind of brought on this, um, these affordable housing amendments that are being discussed. 
We're based in Portland, um, small but active developer of primarily mixed income housing. Um, and um, I just wanted to say one thing that, which was alluded to by Rachel Stamieshkin in her comments earlier, but um, which I don't think we've done a good enough job of getting the word out um, about one of the ways in which our proposal has evolved since we first made it public. Um, and that is with regard to parking. Um, we have a plan right now to provide 68 brand new parking spaces for our proposed 49 unit project. 34 of those would be on in the subdivision that, that Dave Jacobson, Dr. Jacobson is developing. So 34 of them would be in, in the uh, town common circle uh, drive off of Route 77. And then the other 34 would be on town land to the rear of the existing town hall parking lot, um, which we would, we would pay at our completely our own expense to create. And we would share those spaces with the town. Um, so they would be essentially first come first served. That's what, that's what we would propose. And we have, uh, we've had our civil engineer look at this and determine that 34 parking spaces can be created um, following all of the design standards that the town has for parking, including islands and, and um, landscaping and, and the like. Um, so we would be adding a significant resource to the town hall um, which could be used by citizens for meetings and, and um, for town hall business, uh, as well as for, for our residents should our project um, be able to move forward. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan, appreciate it. I'm just seeing if there's anybody else. Uh, I see uh, John, Drew Stevens. Yes. Mr. Stevens. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Fantastic, Drew Stevens. I'm at Two Emerald Way. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick points. I don't think I need nearly the full three minutes, but um, in terms of the overall project, I think there's a real need in Cape Elizabeth for this. Um, and I'll give you a few anecdotal situations. I don't, I didn't do any kind of formal study, but I am in real estate. I do talk to people about homes all the time. And I've come across quite a few people that are in a situation where in general, they're in a house, they would love to sell their house. They have nowhere to go that's affordable. And something like a one or two bedroom apartment in the center of town would fill the need for them and give them a solution that just isn't there right now. And there are quite a few people that I've spoken to in the exact same boat. Um, so it really would allow an avenue for people to have somewhere that they can land when they sell their house. And that's not there right now. And, and I just, um, I know there's a few ordinances that need to be adjusted to make this work but I think that the benefit to the town would be far greater than the changing of ordinances. So I appreciate you giving me a chance to say that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Drew. Appreciate it. Um, see, Sheila Wellahan has her hand up. Or she did. Uh-oh. I did not deliberately try to remove her. I don't think I have, but <laughs> if I did, okay, here, we have another person here. We Sheila, do. are you there? You're, you're, you're muted, Sheila. Take your, take your uh, turn on your microphone. Okay, Sheila, I've got you down in two places. I don't know if that's the problem. I wish I could help you there, Maureen. Uh, I don't know. I, Sheila, you have to unmute yourself. Um, maybe, well, maybe we see if there's anyone else who wants to speak yeah. while we try to work out that little problem there. I guess, Drew, could you take your raised hand, uh, unclick it, or there you go. Okay. 
I'll wait a little bit more. Uh, Rachel has her hand up. Um, okay, Rachel, do you? Well, I will. That's the we'll, second round. Do you have? Well, okay. Do you have additional information, Rachel? Uh, well, this is uh, Piotr Stamieszkin, 27 oh, okay. Stonegate Road. Okay. And uh, obviously, I support comments that Rachel made. However, I just would like to mention there was a comment about people finding a place after they sell the house. And I just want to make sure that this is, this is one of the issues that I think we should understand. I think 80%, I believe, of housing there is, has to meet certain uh, income level. So basically, a person who sells the house in Cape Elizabeth very likely will not qualify because we have too much income. Now, it is possible that they will have large assets and little income and they will qualify, but then it will be a case where you have really affordable housing for people with a lot of assets and little income, which is not really the purpose of affordable housing. So it's, a, it's another consideration that we should understand that really this is not addressing the need of people who move from large houses to an apartment. It also means that a lot of people who work in Cape Elizabeth, like teachers and firefighters and um, policemen, probably will not qualify. Now, unfortunately, it means that financially it will be very difficult for this project to go forward with less than 80% of affordable housing, according to what we heard from a cor um, Zanton Corporation, uh, from Nathan. And I totally understand it, but, but let's, let's understand really what this affordable housing really will be for our community. I still think it's a it's an important step to have affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth, but let's understand what this project really is providing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll attempt to address that, but I'll be, uh, you know, anybody wants to fine tune what I say, we've discussed this particular topic before with Nathan and that is not uh, whatever you sell your home for in Cape Elizabeth, which is like to be a good amount, that does not count as uh, towards the affordable uh, income. Is that correct, Maureen? Not quite correct. Well, I'm not it, sure if I'm saying it right, but. So my understanding is if, and it looks, uh, it looks like we might actually have Sheila functioning at this point to um, speak, I'm not sure. But, um, and I know that Kristen Martin from the Zanton Company has spoken about this, but my understanding is, and I know for a fact this happened to someone else, that if you're selling, selling a, a median level home, um, you're not going to have enough assets that it's going to disqualify you from, from moving into our affordable housing. Um, if, if you're selling a very expensive home and, you know, in Cape Elizabeth, the medium home, I think is 580,000 now. So we're talking significantly more than that. At some point it starts to count against you, but I, I'm not familiar enough with the specifics, but I do know for a fact that you can sell, um, regular homes and still qualify for this. Do we want to see if Sheila Wallahan is available? Yes. Yes. Let's see if we can get Sheila to speak. Are you there, Sheila? Well, you're unmuted on this end. Well, I don't know. Um, she's, okay. there, she's there twice. I see you're there twice. I know, I'm trying to, any, any way we can. I'm not sure if it's a volume thing. Can, or... you, can you hear me? Yay! Oh, yeah, sorry. That's it. That's the, I, it's Sheila Wellahan, 24 Rocky Hill Road. I'm speaking, um, I'm going to echo some of the points that Rachel made. I, I, 2020 has really not just exposed the inequities of our society. Oops. Well, Sheila, I'm not sure what happened, but you dropped out. Let's I'm uh, trying to kill the echoing. Well, let's go. Let's go back to Nathan. Uh, to I, I sense he wants to address. We might be able to. Said. Let's try this. Oh, okay, we're gonna try Sheila. You there? Yep. Okay, right. go ahead. I'm not. Sheila. Anything. And I'm not. Um, uh, 
I, I just wanted to, 24 Rocky Hill Road, I wanted to voice support for the project. Um, as I said, 2020, 2021 has not just exposed the inequities of our society, it's really rubbed them in all of our faces. Um, and Cape Elizabeth is going from, it's, it's, it's getting richer and the, the, the housing costs are skyrocketing every week, every week. Um, I'm I'm surprised at what you know our our middle of the road neighborhoods um, are what what people are paying for them, and uh, like like Rachel, I, I just feel that doing nothing is not an option. Um, that the project might not be ideal, but I it's a start, and you know I I also I think bringing more people to the town to the town center would benefit the town center. The, the town center is anemic. It really, it's, um, our, our current zoning isn't working. And uh, I, I feel like the, do, the choice is, do we want to continue, does Cape Elizabeth want to continue to insulate itself from, from the rest of the world or to give more different people an opportunity to live in the community who will, enrich the community just by virtue of seeing the world a little differently and having maybe having some different life experiences so um you know that's i'm, I'm sure there are, there are issues to be fine-tuned but uh when rachel said doing nothing is not an option that just that's exactly how i feel and that's all i have to say well, thank you very much sheila um, Nathan, you want to speak again? Thank you, Jim. I just wanted to um, clarify, to, to add a little bit of, of information about um, the issue of assets and their in, in, impact on eligibility for our affordable units. Um, the rule in, in the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Program is that 0.2% 6% of assets are counted as income each year. Um, so if a person were to have $100,000 in the bank, that would count as $600 of income. So basically it imputes a very low interest rate to, that, to that, uh, those liquid assets. So for, uh, let's say there's a, um, an elderly widow or widower who's living alone uh, in a single family home that they've lived in for decades, which is one of, one of the key de demographics for this project. Um, they could sell their small single family home in Cape for $400,000 and that would only count as $2,400 of annual income. So they could have up to another about $40,000 of income from other sources annually and still be eligible for one of our lower cost apartments. Um, so that's one of the key demographics that we're looking at. And then the other two, just to review, are young people who grew up in Cape who would love to start their adult lives there but can't currently afford um, any anything um, that's available in Cape. And the third is uh, people who already serve the town through their jobs um, and would love to be able to live in the community where they work um, and who they serve um, but can't currently afford to buy um, a condominium or a single family home in Cape. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I see. Right. Let's see. Is anybody else that hasn't spoken yet want to speak? Okay. Going once. Oh. Well, uh, I'm not sure if it's Rachel or the other. You have some some more to add. Yes. Yes, uh, Mrs. Yes, Mrs. Piotrek. I, I totally understand how it works. I'm just saying is that I would like to see really people who need affordable housing to come here as opposed to people with large assets that will qualify. It just, I think what's important is to understand what kind of, well, how it will work. Increased and, diversity. And I think we want to focus on increasing diversity not just satisfying some final, basically, you know, take, uh, under, 
using the current rules that allow people with substantial assets to live in affordable housing because then it's really that's a that's a it's a it's a different concept a little bit. So I just think that the the board, the planning board, and the the council should really understand uh, what this project will actually uh, provide to to Cape Elizabeth and to a larger community. And I hope it, it does result in increased diversity going beyond people who just move to a smaller place from a larger place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to speak? From the public going once whether they understood it or not who knows <laughs> going twice okay the public comment uh public hearing is now closed um next i'd like to to move on to the amendment but but first i want to get a sense from the board um where you stand i guess specifically on the requirement for first first floor uh, allowing affordable or allowing housing on the first floor as opposed to the requirement the existing requirement for commercial or retail space and at the last time we discussed this there seemed to be an apparent majority of four to three um, in favor of keeping the requirement for commercial uh, and retail on the first floor so but I, I wanted to go over this again. I know Al's not here, but we can, I want to be an informal poll. It's not a vote. And uh, uh, I'll go first. I, it's, I want to do this so we can focus our efforts tonight and not, and not talk or, you know, go around and around and around. I want to, you know, keep driving on here. So I'll go first. Um, I'm in favor to the changes, uh, all the changes, and in particular the requirement to have a, a housing allowed on the first floor. My reasons, uh, one of the, comp the comprehensive plan's goals is to allow more affordable housing. And really the RC and uh, the residency and the town center district are the only places that really have the infrastructure uh, to support that. Um, and I know Maureen did a, a quick study of the lots that were available in the RC district. Um, and in my, my opinion, uh, I don't think those particular lots are gonna be close enough to, I'm not sure of the word services, close enough to shopping, close enough to other things that would make them viable to have affordable housing uh, constructed. So to me, the town center is the only viable uh, part of town where we could have affordable housing. And I, I, I said the last time, if it doesn't happen in town center, it's not going to happen. Uh, just because I don't think the other places will support it. Uh, another reason, retail has changed since the uh, town center district and the comprehensive plan. Um, it was changing then, but it's changed even more. The more people are shopping Amazon, um, you can tell by the vacant spot, uh, vacant stores in, in our own town center, uh, let alone when you go around to the mall or to other places uh, in other towns. So Route 77 doesn't have the year round volume of traffic in my opinion to support retail. And this particular building is set back, was it like 300 feet from the road? And based on my own experience, uh, as I said before in Freeport, we were one street down from the main street in Freeport. It was a ghost town. And I think that will be the case for this because it's set so far back to the road, it's not going to draw people in. So I think if we make them have first floor commercial retail, um, they, the spaces will stay empty. Also with the pandemic, people have realized they can now work from home and be just as productive or more productive than going into the office. So we, we talk retail, but it's also office space. It could be office space. And I just don't see that being viable. We heard from developers that are not related to this project say they have trouble renting out their spaces. Uh, one was in Sanford, they're talking about South Portland, Falmouth, um, they're having trouble. So um, anyway, I'm in favor of having housing on the first floor after that long-winded speech. So anyway, Dan, 
you're on deck. How do you feel? Um, I, I just want to uh, speak to the housing on the or uh, commercial or um, um, retail on the first floor, and I'm in favor of keeping retail and commercial on the first floor. Okay. Thanks. All right, Andrew. Uh, yeah. I Honestly, I've gone back and forth on this. I actually did watch the town council's workshop on video. It was, um, you know, fairly substantial conversation. It was clear that they were, um, you know, the majority were in favor. There were still people, still town council members in, in opposition to this and, and dealing, grappling with the same issues we, we have been grappling with. Um, and, you know, Part of me still strongly wants to keep this commercial first floor, but I also know that it's, it seems to me, to be honest, that the writing is on the wall. So um, in seeing that, uh, not, not to necessarily want to cave per se, but I would rather have input into how this goes forward, knowing that it does seem like affordable housing is a real need for the town. And we've heard that, I mean, consistently across the board. I mean, I don't think you know, everybody always says, I, we don't, you know, this project doesn't, isn't right for the town. We know we need affordable housing. So I don't think the town is in opposition to that. Uh, and so I, I think I would be okay with commercial space being left out um, on the first floor, but only in the case where, because it's set back and not on, you know, basically not street facing. I think hundred percent anything street facing should be kept commercial which is clearly in the spirit of the town center plan um i have a lot more issues with with all of these various other pieces of it um that you know i could discuss down the road but speaking with commercial thing uh piece of it um you know i'm hesitant but okay kicking that to the curb and uh, but only in regards to it being set back and not uh, street facing. Thanks, Andrew. Carol Ann. Uh, when it comes to uh, non-residential space on the first floor, I am not opposed to uh, negating that requirement and not, along with what Andrew said, as long as it's not right on the street, as long as it's set back, as you alluded to, Jim, when it becomes non-viable as a commercial space because it is so far out of the mainstream, uh, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to commercial space being eliminated on the first floor. But I think there have to be uh, restrictions around it. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right. Thanks, Carolyn. Mary Ann. I'm in support of eliminating the commercial space requirement completely. But I wanna remind people that the amendment before us tonight would only eliminate it for a substantial public benefit of uh, low-income housing that provides at least 36 units. Um, and I obviously support that. But in terms of eliminating the commercial space, I think what we've seen, um, staff has provided us with a memo that there's over a million square feet of available office space in the local area. Um, in Cape Elizabeth alone, as long as I've lived here, there's always been vacant commercial space in the town center. So I don't think we need a requirement um, that adds or requires more commercial space when we can't seem to fill the commercial space that we have. Um, and frankly, I think our current ordinance is broken for some of the reasons that Jim has talked about in terms of changes to uh, retail. I walked around the old port the other day and there's so many vacant spaces. Perhaps some of it is pandemic, but I think some of it is also the way we changed our shopping. So I'd like to see us uh, advise the council that they should eliminate the commercial space completely, but I certainly support the narrower exemption of eliminating the commercial space when there's the substantial benefit of affordable housing. 
Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, how's, uh, Jonathan. Um, I am not really in favor of um, eliminating the commercial space. And I say I'm not really in favor of it because I am amend amendable to possibly discussing it um, if it's going to be not including building a fourth floor. So if somebody wanted to do three floors and eliminate the commercial space at the ground floor, then I would I probably would be open to that idea, but I, I don't like the idea. And I've said this during the workshops. Um, I don't like the idea of um, basically changing four different parts of a zoning ordinance for one particular project. And I know, so I would not be in favor of getting rid of the commercial space. I know I can hear the arguments that are being made about seeing so many vacant spots, but I just would remind people that we are in coming out of a pandemic um, whether that has had an economic crush on this country. Uh, Cape Elizabeth has not been immune to that. Port Maine has not been immune to that. And so I think that if we try to say, well, if you look at it right now, commercial is changing. Okay, that's fair. I can understand that. But that's not our role as a planning board. Our role is to look five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road. And I think that if we lose this commercial space, we're losing out on an opportunity to have more commercial space in the town center, which is obviously part of the comprehensive plan uh, that has been on the books for a long time. So that's that's my view on it. I would not be in favor of losing this commercial space in these circumstances as being uh, asked by us for the town council to make a recommendation. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Carol Ann. I just wanna comment on something in general, and that is, in the ideal world, somebody would have said, gee, we ought to think about uh, affordable housing. And we would have formed a committee and we would have spent a few months thinking about town-wide how we would look at affordable housing for the town of Cape Elizabeth. And it's my understanding that the state is looking at getting together and asking all towns to look at how affordable housing would fit within their community because it is such a great need today. And but we don't live in that ideal world. We got handed this in a project idea came up and they said, okay, how, how would we need to change the ordinances for a project such as this to be viable? And I don't wanna do ordinance changes that only suit one project. I wanna do an ordinance change and maybe it's a town center that will cover the entire town center and allow for other possible uh, low income housing or affordable housing to be built in the town center if possible or in other places in the community. But we've got to get away from talking about how, how Stanton's, Stanton's project would, uh, you know, what the requirements are in order to qualify to be there. That's not what I'm concerned with. I'm concerned with the project and the ordinances necessary. And I, I just think affordable housing has become a real important issue and we should be looking at it as a global thing and not as what does Zanton want to do. And we keep getting locked down into the weeds of what Zanton wants to do. And I think, I mean, God love them for wanting to do something, but we really gotta look at how can we do this town-wide? Okay. That's Thank it. You. That's my soapbox. Okay. <laughs> uh, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I actually totally agree with Caroline. It was actually something I basically wanted to get into, though you're, you had sort of a narrow question there about the commercial space. And, and that's that I actually, I don't love the metrics that are being put to these narrowly crafted ordinance because i think i agree it's like i think if it's such a, a a need who cares if it's a 10 unit affordable housing versus a 50 unit i think you know and actually there was an email today i think basically suggesting that we remove the absolute number and maybe you know stick with the percentage so maybe you know if it, you know you get x if at least 70 percent, but there's no actual number it doesn't have to be 36 maybe it's only a four unit affordable housing unit, but even those three units are, are, are important these days, it sounds like, I mean, and so every little bit counts. So I would kind of step back um, sort of as Carol Ann's saying and, 
and look at it as like, how can you promote the development of affordable housing? And, and one of those things is not to put in strong metrics that require massive development. Maybe it's, you know, five buildings of eight units or something, you know, maybe you get to a larger number of units, but you're doing it in a smaller way, which means, you know, less property overall, but you're, you're maybe you're giving a density increase um, to those units because I mean, I think a substantial benefit, people can argue to the nth degree what substantial means, and it probably could get litigated to the nth degree. Um, I think that would be a very hard thing to actually say what's substantial and not if, if you know, three units may be substantial to a number of people. Um, so I, I, I would agree to take a step back and look at the town center and actually put forward to the council something that's that's more broad than just thinking about this one project um, and, you know, knowing that affordable housing is important. And I, I actually would disagree with you, Jim, too, on the, on that affordable housing couldn't exist out, you know, anywhere but the town center. I mean, I don't think, you know, we're not talking about, it's, this isn't, you know, people who are unlikely to have cars or what, or whatnot. I mean, clearly they're going to have cars because, they're, they're planning 68 units, you know, uh, parking um, spaces. So, you know, if this existed in outside the town center, I think it would be fine too. And, um, you know, there, there are, you know, Maureen put that nice map together of the three and five acre lots. And I think for those areas, we just need to look at increasing the density per lot so that you can have a larger number of units so that the developers can hit the targets they need to be able to make it viable. And so, you know, I, I really think we need to take a step back and look at it at a much higher level and provide, you know, some numbers and um, guidance that speaks to the issue as a whole. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marianne. Thank you. I, I just wanna be clear also, I'm not reacting to any particular development, but as we've, discussed this over the last three months and studied the issues, it's very clear to me that Cape Elizabeth's zoning is really truly exclusionary zoning, perhaps not intentional, but certainly de facto exclusionary zoning. We have minimum lot sizes. We have uh, direct costs such as parking and open space requirements that get passed on and increase the cost of housing. We um, prohibit multifamily housing in a number of areas, all of which um, makes us a very exclusionary town. And as one of the earlier speakers said, uh, 2020 has been kind of a, uh, an awakening for a lot of people, I think. And uh, I agree with the speakers who said we need to act, but I wanna really be clear. I'm not proposing that we act because of a particular developer, I'm proposing that we act because we have an ordinance that is broken with respect to affordable housing, broken with respect to diversity, and frankly, broken with respect to the commercial. So, thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Daniel. Oh, thanks a lot, Jim. Um, I know I didn't provide a lot of comment about, um, you know, agreeing to keep the commercial and the um, the business side, but I agree with um, what Carol Ann has said and what Jonathan has said and what Marianne just said. You know, we need to look at this comprehensively, not just for one project. Um, and there was an email that, or you know, a, a resident commented today. I really liked what he said in his in his letter. You know, it just seems like we're kind of just you know jumping through hoops for one individual. And I'm looking at um, the map that um, that Maureen put together. We've got. 16 three to five acre sites, you know, within Cape. And I understand that we have to change ordinances to make that um, viable for affordable housing, but gosh, you know, I'm surprised we have that many and I'm excited about that. So, um, and then, you know, relative to the business uh, and the commercial side uh, and, and just uh, speaking uh, a little bit about what Jonathan said, you know, we, need, we don't need to look at today we need to look at five to 10 years down the road um, because we're gonna, we're crawling out of COVID and things may change, you know, in the next couple of years, especially 
um, you know, with, with regards to uh, business in the town center. So I just a couple comments there. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Jonathan. Since this has kind of turned into what our thoughts are on this and gone beyond the commercial uh, question, um, I, I, I agree with what everybody said here. I think we all have the same mindset. Um, and I think Marianne is right when it comes to the zoning ordinances in Cape that they can be exclusionary. Um, at the same time, though, I mean, to me, I, Carolyn nailed it when she said, yeah, ideally, we would have somebody would have said, you know what, we really have to look at our affordable um, housing ordinances or our zoning ordinance to see how we can fit in affordable housing. And it didn't happen because really it wasn't presented to us. Now it's presented to us. And from looking and thinking about affordable housing, to me, one of the big things about the value of affordable housing is diversity, is uh, from um, a racial standpoint, from an economic standpoint, uh, but also from a family standpoint. And one of the big issues that I have is I want affordable housing to be available for families. And I think if we have a development that has very limited ability to provide for more than uh, one bedroom units, uh, I think that that can be almost discriminatory as well, um, because you would not be able to really provide to families. Uh, they would not be able to live in a one bedroom place. And I know that I, I applaud the developer for coming in and being able to fit in, a, um, I think it was eight two bedroom locations. But to me, if we're gonna put together an affordable housing uh, amendment or, or ordinance, uh, half or third, of those units would be multi-bedroom units. And that would promote the, uh, the inclusion of families as part of uh, the availability for affordable housing. So if we're, if we're talking about wish lists, if we're talking about what we wanna see the ordinance be, that would be something that I would want to have part of uh, the ordinance. And maybe we do need to just make a wish list for the town council because they will be ultimately be the ones who are deciding and given, or, or Maureen, are you waving at me? He's writing. <laughs> Actually, with the time. Okay. Anyway, but that that's sort of my point. I think we do have an ability to make a to do something here, and we should be doing something. We've been tasked to do something, and we are doing something. Um, but I think if we are speaking about what what is our ideal scenario, what would be the the ordinance that would bring about what we think would be a value, uh, a substantial value to the community with affordable housing, we should be open to what we want to see the affordable housing look like. Thanks, uh, Marianne. Uh, I just also want to clarify because I, I'm not sure, I, mm -hmm. I might, might have been misunderstood. When I say I'm not reacting to any particular developer, that is true. At the same time, I do feel a sense of urgency it, there is a project before us um, and there are opportunities. I agree with Carol Ann that the ideal world, there'd be maybe a different time frame, but I uh, don't want to suggest that there's any lack of urgency because I think that other people have, uh, from the public have spoken and said, inaction is not an option. So I'd like to see us still move forth with recommendations to the council in or near the time frame that the council had asked of us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Maureen. So, you know, I actually think the comp plan is a pretty good plan. And I want to point to you recommendation number 83. And I'll read it to you. And my suggestion would be that if you so feel you could package your recommendation of the council, not with this affordable housing amendment, but also with a request to authorize you to undertake um, recommendation number 83. And that recommendation in the comp plan says, undertake a housing diversity study that evaluates current housing costs, needs, impacts on services and other relevant elements and recommends actions to create more affordable opportunities for seniors to downsize and for young adults and young families to move to Cape Elizabeth. At a minimum, options to evaluate should include incentives to create a permanently affordable housing and municipal purchase of land for construction of affordable housing and coordination of regional efforts with the Metro Coalition. This is not a recommendation that has been assigned to anyone at this time. 
And you feel like doing that, huh, Maury? I, I don't, but it sounds like you guys do. <laughs> Jonathan, you have your hand up or for more or you just haven't taken it down from there you go okay sorry all right well we've got a whole range of comments here but it appears i know al's not here but as i remember he was in favor of keeping the commercial in our last discussion but it appears there may be uh, grounds to to discuss what I guess we can call option one, which includes um, eliminating the commercial retail requirement for the town center. I guess, uh, like Mary and I, we've got this project before us, and if we, I, I know we talked about studying it, but that I think that would add months to whatever we're talking about right now, and we may come up with a great plan, but uh, the project before us, they may say, we, we can't wait that long. We got to make a decision and they pull it out and we haven't accomplished anything. So um, anyway, we're, uh, Carol Ann, you got your hand up. I just want to say, I know I started all this, but I, I support Marianne and what she said. And, and I think I also support the boring suggestion that we put to the town that we can send something forward on the town center and we can study the town as a whole. And it may, it may create more changes in the town center. Who knows, but yeah. you, you know where I'm going with this here. <laughs> Am yeah. I making any sense? <laughs> yeah. In an ideal world, I, I would like to be able to vote on, you come up and vote on something tonight, but I understand if we go around and around and we can, then we'll, we'll table it. But you know, we have a deadline, and I would like to meet the deadline. I, I um, thought we should send the the uh, town council two suggestions. Say it again, Carolyn. Two suggestions to the town council. Well, what's that? Is it commercial space without commercial space. Send them both up and there. Let them, and let them fight it out. I Got second it? that motion. <laughs> well, okay. I, <laughs> I guess we could do that, but. Uh, Andrew. Yeah. One other thing that I ran across and, I, and um, that may actually be another ordinance thing that I, I'm, I, I can't remember though, the, the, the actual dimensions of the building, I feel like they were in, in excess of hundred feet. And then I was seeing this maximum building dimension of a hundred feet. And if, can somebody remind me what it actually is? Maureen. It says a continuous dimension of a hundred feet. So if you have jogs, it meets the requirement and the design as submitted does not have a, a continuous 100 foot length without a jog. All right, I'm just looking at the table. It says nothing about continuous. It just says maximum building dimension. So maybe they're defined somewhere else, but um, I just noticed that I was like, oh, wait a second, this thing, is that another one we have to consider? I'm just making sure we're considering everything that would need to be changed if that was a thing. No, no, um, Marianne. I actually wanted to um, move option one. Um, I do think that, I mean, I think Carol Ann is right. The council will consider commercial or not, but I think we owe it to them as the planning board to give them our recommendation. So I would, after this discussion on the commercial space issue, I would like to move option one. My understanding is option one and option two are identical, but for the commercial space. I believe so. Issue? That is correct. That there, is correct. There's also a multi-use definition change that goes with option one. Yes. That's right. So this way, I think we have fulfilled our responsibility as a planning board um, and we will give our advice to the council and then they will decide and ultimately can, they will decide between commercial or not but I would agree with with uh, Marianne on that let's give them if they don't like it they can they can change it um, uh, Jim can I just ask one question with regards to that yeah uh, since I guess this is a motion um, Marianne, you were not on the board when we went and did the um, 
the short-term rental recommendation that we were asked to give. And one of the things that we did with that recommendation was sort of give the recommendation, but then we gave a statement from the planning mm -hmm. about our feelings on this. Would we, or would the board be amendable to kind of talking about that? Um, sure. or, or like having a statement that went along with that? Yep, I I had planned on that happening all along, Jonathan. Okay. Make it, make yeah. It clear. I had planned on an accompanying letter all along. No, and and so I would second Marianne's motion on this um, to move this forward because I think that it is something we should be acting on. It. The town council had asked asked us to do it. Um, I would like to have a, a letter that would go along with it. Um, I'm seconding the motion. I'm not sure if I'm going to vote in favor of the motion. I don't think that's necessary, but um, I, I just do think that Marion is in Carolina are correct that we need to move on this and give a recommendation to the town council because they are the policy makers. They're the elected officials who come up um, and make that decision. We have a motion Here. before us. Well, go ahead, Maureen. I, I mean, unless I misunderstood, didn't, didn't, Ms. Jordan already make a motion that was seconded by Mr. Sarbeck, or is it just a casual comment? It was a casual comment, Mary Ann. And it was a casual second, too. Got it. Casual. <laughs> now, noted. <laughs> that was my understanding. Good, good. So now we have a uh, move option one, a recommendation of the town council by Ms. Lynch, seconded by Mr. Sarbeck. Correct. Okay, we have a motion before the board. Is there any further discussion on this? Well, are we going to talk about the accompanying letter and comment separately, or? Um, I think we should. Uh, or well, I, what do people think? Do we want to make that letter part of this discussion, or do we want to vote on this motion and then take up the letter? Any feelings one way or the other? Mar uh, Marianne. I think it's hard to write that kind of letter in a, uh, a Zoom meeting like this. Maureen has listened to all of the pros and cons and the points. I'd like to suggest that um, we vote on this and that she draft a letter for, uh, do we get to meet again before our deadline? I guess not. Perhaps she could draft a letter that she could share. Maybe we have a workshop next week just on the wording of the letter. Maureen. I mean, just a suggestion to try to facilitate the board's work. If you're willing to take the vote now and then have a discussion, I can pull up a document and just type some notes of what you want to include in that letter. And then I can send your motion to the council at the end of this month. And the deadline for that is May 1st for the May 10th meeting. And you have a workshop on May 4th. I could take your comments that you're gonna come up with tonight and put a draft letter together that you could discuss May 4th and still get it to the council before the May 10th meeting. Okay. Okay. That work? Yeah. Works for me. Okay. Well, we have a motion. Uh, it's been seconded. We've discussed it. Uh, Maureen, would you, and it's for option to, uh, I guess actually Ma Maureen had it, uh, but it's to recommend option one to the town council for consideration. So Maureen, would you call the roll? I will. Mr. Bedensky. Uh, no. Uh, Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Miss Jordan. Yes. Miss Lynch. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. No. Miss uh, Chair Hubner. Yes. That's a four to two vote. Motion passes. Okay. Great. Um, moving on to where's my agenda? Uh, moving on public, uh, no, we got, uh, we're going to have a conversation now. Yes. We have a conversation now. You had, uh, remember you had some things you wanted to talk about Maureen. Well, I thought we could, if we could just take five minutes and let me start jotting down what you wanted to have in this letter. 
I can tell you, I want, I, I would like to see you put forward that we should begin a study of a comprehensive plan item 83. Is that right? Did I remember the number? You did. Not that I really want to do it, but I guess if I start this mess, I ought to be part of it for a while. <laughs> because I think we need to look at it comprehensively for the town. No. Jonathan. Um, I would like to see something along the lines of that. I think that the, uh, the affordable housing should have substantial diversity in number of rooms or um, I don't know how you would put it, uh, but um, substantial diversity with regards to um, units, uh, bedroom units within the uh, within the affordable housing as well. And to me, substantial diversity would be a 50-50 or a third, a third, a third, something along those lines, not a 90 or 80% range <laughs> one way or the other. And right. the reason for that is that yeah. it would create diversity among um, uh, who would be the people who would be able to live in those housing units. Yeah, good point. Uh, Marianne. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make sure that our letter is very clear on how truly narrow the uh, commercial change is. And we're just sort of dipping our toes in the water here. And uh, I, I want to make sure the council understands that it's a very narrow proposal that I think at the last meeting we determined would apply to about six, four or six lots in the town center zone. Maureen, you can correct me on how many lots. That's right in the right range. Yes. Thank you. Daniel. Yeah, right. I, I don't know if, if, if we can add this. Marie, don't, don't start, don't start um, writing, but I know the developer talked a little bit about the income requirements. And I don't know, um, you know, Marine, if we have the um, ability um, to comment on that. Um, you know, for example, having assets of a couple hundred thousand in the bank and you can still qualify for this low income housing. You know, I don't, can we talk about that or or can we can we change that, or or is that part of the developers, um, you know, deal with the state? So. I think that's the way the the main state rules are written, is my understanding. Oh, okay. I mean, we it, have no it, state. It, yeah, right. <clears throat> if, if we can't change that, then I'm, you know, it's fine. But I'm just bringing that up. I I think um, um, some of the uh, you know some of the uh, the town folks that called in um, made up some good points there. So. I, I just don't know if we, so if we can't change it, we can't change it, but. Yeah, well, well Dan, we, we could change it, but then what, what would happen is that none of the affordable housing that is proposed in CAVE would be able to take advantage of any of the subsidies that are available, yeah, which I, basically would not mean, which would be just one more time where we've not allowed affordable housing. Right, right. I, yeah, it's just maybe just a comment I, I, that I have, but um, so you can. Well, I think. Up. I think we could still leave it there in order to address it. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Carol Ann, thanks Dan. Uh, I wonder, I don't know if the town council received a copy of Randy Blake's comments because I thought they were very good comments where he talked about the Maine State Housing Authority and and then setting their rulings. And, and I think that goes to what Dan just talked about. Uh, how does the Maine State Housing Authority factor into this and, and the rules that they set? Yeah, it was a very good letter he wrote. Good for them to see Randy's comments. Yeah, it was a good letter.
I don't know if we want to make a comment that the, the board was not unanimous in uh, these recommendations, just so they know it's, mm -hmm. so it's slam dunk. I, I think that should be added in there as well. Yeah, I think it should be the first thing. Agree. Um, sorry, and I think that we should also put in there that we received a lot of public comment with regards to this and um, I would, I would say and I don't know if I'm, uh, but it didn't seem like, or it, it seemed like a lot of the public comment was not in favor of these four <laughs> amendment changes um, to this obviously the public doesn't sit through the board meetings so the presentations like we do but I think that that should be in there as well. Because I would hate to ask the public to then start commenting again, or maybe we should say that we would ask them to consider the comments that have already been made as part of uh, their deliberations when it comes to this. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, I can tell you that pretty much all of the public comment that the planning board has received has also been sent to the council on this item. Okay, good to know, thanks. Anybody else? <clears throat> I guess, we, you know, if we do move on from this letter, if you think of something <clears throat> after we sign off or in the, before we actually send a letter out, you know, I'm sure, you know, send an email to Maureen so she can include it. Andrew. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, my opinion has been, and I think others have agreed that this should be a, that our, what the board would have preferred would have been something more broad in terms of uh, our, you know, I don't know if you, you want to put that in there, but um, because when the first the first meeting that the planning board had on discussing amendments, the first thing that you were asked was, do you want to write an amendment that covers the whole town center or just narrowly make it a minimalist amendment? And there was, I think you pretty much all agreed you wanted it minimalist. There might've been one person who didn't. Apparently we've changed our minds over time. I would definitely <laughs> think that, yes. So that's why I wouldn't, I would, I think everything you're saying says you want it broad, but maybe you don't want to say you would have liked it to be broad because anyway, I will, I will draft up comments and then uh, you'll have them before the May 4th workshop. They will absolutely be draft comments so that the planning board can completely tear them apart and start all over if, if that's what they want to do. Okay. Well, thank you, Maureen. Um, um, go ahead. Can I? Yeah, go ahead, Marianne. I just also want, uh, I hope the letter will point out that not just that we received a lot of comments, but we've all read and appreciated all of the comments that were received. Good point. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, what's well, a start, Maureen? This is very helpful. I thank you very much. Yeah, it's 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 not fun starting from a blank page. So this is this will help you out. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I know uh, business of a planning board. I know Mary uh, Maureen. Uh, there were some up there. The general discussion you wanted to talk about tonight. I do, but I I just need a moment to save this so yep. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> now he's going back and watch again maureen <laughs> well i guess i could do that um so I, I don't want to hold you up but i just wanted to cover a couple of things um there is a plan that is sitting in my office right now that the applicant would love for board members to sign and i didn't know if i could just put a call out for board members to kind of drop by town hall and call me up and will let you into the locked building and you could try to sign it over the next couple of days or whether you want to pick 
a time and I'll just meet you out back and the old alternative planning board meeting room in the garage or you know where to find me Maureen I'd be happy to go and collect your signature okay. Councilor Jordan I will I will not I, I'm not too far from there from 8 7 30 a.m to 5 p.m happy to do it anyone else <laughs> do I have any other takers <laughs> Well, you only need three more signatures because you got mine. I, I can come by at your convenience, Maureen. I'll be back in town tomorrow. So I'll okay. come by Thursday or Friday. Great. Just just give me a call if, if you can do that. Anyone got it. You, just, you just got up there, Marianne. Holy cow. Maureen, I can come by tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I can come by tomorrow after one o'clock. Um, I'll just give you a jingle. That right. would be super. Thank okay. you very much. All right. Anyone else? That should do it. I need four signatures and I, that, that would be four. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, there has been, I just wanted to go over this. Um, I think there's been a little bit of confusion about when I send out the invite for the regular planning board meeting. I just wanna make sure board members know that um, the, the link for the Zoom meeting has to be created before we send out notices for the meeting. So information comes in for the board meeting 18 days in advance that's a friday the following monday i'm creating the meeting um, id number so that uh, support staff can do the notices and that's when you get that panelist invite so it's coming more than two weeks before the meeting and i think that might be confusing some people if you lose that email um, the other thing that we have, thanks to Mr. Gilbert, is that the agenda now has an actual um, hyperlink. And if you look at the agenda that gets sent to you a week before the meeting and you click on that hyperlink, it'll take you to the meeting. And then I will be looking for you in the attendees list. So if you can make it to the meeting, I can find a way to turn you into a panelist. And I just wanna make sure everyone was, was aware that that was an option. And, this, this notification of the meeting is coming very early for you, but it's because we have to create everything. Uh, the last item is something uh, I think we need to, I would appreciate if the board could give some guidance on, and it needs to be discussed as a generic uh, review item. Uh, but I have a concern. I sent you an email this afternoon that if the planning board receives multiple site plan amendments for and this is individual applications for the same site. Um, after you act on the first item, on the, the, when you go to the second item, the second meeting, there is a real problem with creating an administrative record for whatever your decision is. Because when, when you receive an application, those materials are prepared 18 days in advance. And so if someone, for example, submitted an application to amend the landscaping for the library and you approve that at the meeting, and then the second item was to change parking at the library, you are now looking at a plan that doesn't reflect the most recently approved site plan. So I have concerns about creating an administrative record in those circumstances. And I am asking you, to give me direction as staff to either not allow more than one amendment application at a time before the planning board per property, or to encourage applicants to put all of their site plan application, site plan amendments on the same application package. That would seem to make more sense putting everything you want to do in one application. Me. Well, you are the planning board, and I like to think the planning board is supposed to be comprehensive. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I like option number two, just putting it all, you know, in one application at one time. Makes sense. Maureen, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, have we had circumstances where in the past, I'm just trying to think of plans that we've approved and then somebody has come back for a site plan amendment on that approved plan. Um, and has there been any that have had multiple in the past? 
I've right. never had an instance where someone has tried to amend a site plan with multiple applications at the same time, because the advice has always been package everything together, put it all on one application. You only pay one application fee. You're only paying for the engineer to review one set of plans. You're only creating one escrow account. Um, and to break it up into separate pieces is, um, I've never seen that done. Well, the, the, one of the things that comes to mind, and I don't remember exactly, because this is, I think, literally my first planning board meeting back in like 2015 was, I wasn't on the sea salt approval, but I remember they came in with a change in the plan on getting rid of a tree and then changing some signage. And uh, those were, those were different. Those were not all on the same. Those were not two different applications. It was one amendment asking for two different things. So it was okay. the same plan. I'm not saying you have to do one amendment at a time. I'm saying you can do as many. I'm actually encouraging that you consider all the amendments you want. You create a master list and you show them all in one application. And okay. I, I truly believe the board is perfectly capable of working your way through a list. Well, I'm all, I'm all in favor of doing things that we've done in the past. And if that's what we've done in the past and it's been easier, then I would be in support of that. Andrew. All right, Maureen, I got kicked off the internet for some reason for about five minutes. So I know you were maybe speaking to me. It I'm wasn't me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was we're really not. awkward. <laughs> I was like, you froze. And I was like, Maureen, where are you? Wait, you know what's sad? Me. Nobody noticed, Andrew. <laughs> it wasn't that important, I'm sure. You know? <laughs> I think it sounded better without just frozen. I just, I just evaporated and it was perfect. There's no, no, no answer to the question. So that's just the way it should go. Just say yes. Gone, so I'm not even sure what we're, I mean, I think we're talking about the, one of the emails I saw today that was somewhat vague. Yes. Um, the, the email I sent today was asking the board for directions on multiple amendments of a single site plan. And that, if there are multiple amendments requested for a single site plan, they should not be handled as separate uh, separate applications. You either put the entire list of your requested amendments on one list, one application. If you want to separate them out, you can only do one per meeting, because it's it's in, the concern the concern I have is you know when you make that motion based on the plans and the materials submitted. You, you could be amending things that aren't that on, are on a plan that's now out of date because of the first item on the agenda. No, I think it's overly confusing and it should all just be on the, I totally agree. It makes no sense to have it on any, anything other than a single application. Okay. Okay, does that give you enough guidance, Maureen? It does, I will um, use that guidance on any future applications. Okay. Um, all right. Anything more on that particular subject then, Maureen? That's it. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or anything on the business of the planning board? General questions. Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion we adjourn. Second. Second. All right. Please take the roll, Maureen. Mr. Bedensky. Yes, please. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Oh, did we lose? Oh, no, oh she's just goodness. muted. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I didn't think you'd have a problem with that. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. And Ch Chair Hubner. Yes. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Uh, excellent meeting planning. Thank you. For, we'll, uh, we'll see y'all at the plan at the workshop, I guess, if not sooner. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you.